Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and today I thought it would be fun to take a look at Time Magazine's best books of 2022 so far. At the beginning of July I will be doing my own best books of 2022 so far so I thought it would be fun to check in with what they say is the best and see which of these books I have read, if any, how many of them I'd be willing to read and uh, all of that stuff. So Let's dive right in to their list. I'll put a link to their article in the description box down below if you would like to check it out for yourself. The first book on their list is The Naked Don't Fear the Water by Matthew Akins. And this is something I had not heard of. So I'm going to read the quick little description of it that they have underneath and see if it's something that I would be interested in reading. In 2016, Canadian journalist Matthew Eikens went undercover for going his passport and identity to join his Afghan friend Omar, who was fleeing his war-torn country and leaving the woman he loved behind. Their harrowing experience is the basis for Eikens' book, The Naked Don't Fear the Water, which chronicles the duo's dangerous and emotional journey on the refugee trail from Afghanistan to Europe. As they are confronted with the many realities of war, Eikens spares no details in his urgent and empathetic narrative. That does sound really interesting. So yes, this does seem like something that I would be interested in reading. I don't think I'd go out and purchase it, but I would definitely check the subscription apps that I use to see if there's an audio copy of it available anywhere and maybe consider putting a hold on it at some point. I do think I might want a little bit of feedback from people. So if you've read it, I'd love to hear what you thought of it uh, because I don't think this is something that would be a priority for me at all, which means it could very well get lost in the shuffle, especially since nothing would happen this month because June is when I read LGBTQ books. So anything that is not LGBTQ is automatically getting pushed to July or later. And that could not bode well for something like this in terms of getting actually in my hands and on my reading list. But it does sound like it would be really interesting. The cover is very pretty for whatever that is worth. The next one is In Love by Amy Bloom. I have not read this. I remember seeing a blurb of it in the beginning of the year, but I'm going to read the quick thing that they have for it here. I have read a, an Amy Bloom book before. I think it was called Away, and I remember liking it, didn't love it, but liked it. So I'm open to reading another book of hers. This says, The first pages of Amy Bloom's memoir set up the book's devastating ending. It's January 2020, and Bloom and her husband are traveling to Switzerland, but only Bloom will return home. Her husband plans to end his life through a program based in Zurich. Apparently, I did not read a blurb for this book, because I feel like I would have remembered that. He has Alzheimer's and wants to die on his terms. Bloom introduces these facts swiftly and then packs an emotional punch. The next time she's on an airplane, she'll be flying alone. From there, Bloom details her husband's wrenching decision and all that led up to their trip abroad. Though In Love is rooted in an impossibly sad situation, Bloom's narrative is more than just an expertly crafted narrative on death and grief. It's a beautiful love letter from a wife to her husband rendered in the most delicate terms about the life they shared together. That sounds like it would be really difficult, but beautiful. I can see where Amy Bloom, based on the novel of hers that I read, would be a great person to tell a story like this and do a really good job of it. It's kind of shades of the year of magical thinking, which is another really difficult read, but just beautiful. And if you haven't read it, I would absolutely recommend it. But I, again, I would probably read this before I would read the uh, Aikens book, but I'm not going to prioritize it. There's enough depressing stuff going on right now without me adding to it. So the likelihood that I would get to this is fairly small. I might have to wait <laughs> until next year. And by then, I might have moved on to other things. So it's just the way it is. The next one is The School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan. This one I had seen, and I, I guess I kind of thought I knew what it was about, and then somebody started telling me about it, and I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> And it does sound really interesting, so let's do their quick description of it first. Frida Liu is a 30-something single mother struggling to keep up with the demands of her office job and raising her 18-month-old daughter after her husband left her for a younger woman. In Jessamine Chan's unsettling debut novel, we begin on Frida's worst day, when her lack of sleep has caused a lapse in judgment and she leaves her baby at home alone for two hours. Soon, Frida is sent to a government-run facility with other mothers deemed failures. 
by the state. Reminiscent of The Handmaid's Tale, this eerie page-turner is a captivating depiction of a dystopian world that feels entirely possible. It's not only the gripping story of Frida's personal struggle, but also a thought-provoking work of commentary on American motherhood. This is something I've really been thinking about reading ever since someone actually described the plot of the book to me, and I was like, wait a minute, what is this book about? And it does sound really interesting. It does sound like, given the current political climate, it might hit a little too close to home, but that's also kind of the point. So I have been kind of thinking about it, but I haven't actually started seeking it out. I think this is something that, if it crosses my path, like if there's an audio copy available on a subscription app or something like that, I would very likely check it out and read it. But until that happens, I'm probably going to keep a little bit of distance. But if you have feedback on this book and you think I should change my mind and try to fit it in because I have heard good things about it, let me know in the comment section down below because I could be persuaded to give it a try. The next one is The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. This is the sort of spiritual cousin to A Visit from the Goon Squad. Let's see what they say about it. One of the most anticipated books of the year, The Candy House, is Jennifer Egan's follow-up to her Pulitzer Prize-winning 2010 novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad. That book was hailed for its innovative structure. One chapter was written as a PowerPoint presentation, and the new narrative follows suit in its impressive construction. This time, Egan spins fresh commentary on technology, memory, and privacy through 14 interlinked stories. In them, a machine called Own Your Unconscious allows people to revisit any memories from their past whenever they want if only they make those memories accessible to everyone else. It's a thrilling concept brought together by Egan's astute hand, offering a powerful look at how we live in an increasingly interconnected world. I've heard very mixed things so far. So if you've read The Candy House, I would love to hear what your thoughts are in the comment section down below. I do have access to the audio of this book. The barrier for entry for me is that I do want to reread A Visit from the Goon Squad first. And now that we're into June, my Pride Month reading is kind of in the way of that. So I might do it in July. In fact, I had I thought I had an idea for what my next Pulitzer Prize book was going to be. And then I kind of realized that I would want to reread this, A Visit from the Goon Squad, before diving into the Candy House. So it's very likely that A Visit from the Goon Squad is probably going to be my next Pulitzer Prize book. And then I'll get to the other idea that I had after that. Because I want to do a visit from the Goon Squad before I get to the Candy House. Just so I'm kind of in the universe. Even though it's not a direct sequel. I want to be in the headspace for it. And I've heard mixed things. I do worry that it's a book where the idea or the intention is going to be a lot more interesting than the execution. But we'll see. And again, if you have thoughts, I would love to hear them in the comment section down below. The next one is Olga Dies Dreaming. And I am not going to attempt to pronounce the author's name. If I had been doing this in advance or preparing in advance, I would have looked up how to pronounce it. I didn't. I apologize. So I am just going to tell you that the book is Olga Dies Dreaming and put the cover so you can see the author's name. It's the summer of 2017, and Olga Acevedo is seemingly thriving. She's a wedding planner for the Manhattan elite and living in a posh and rapidly gentrifying Brooklyn neighborhood. The protagonist of this absorbing debut novel had humble origins as the daughter of Puerto Rican activists, raised by her grandmother in another part of the borough where she taught herself everything she needed to know to be where she is today. But in Olga Dies Dreaming, the reality of Olga's self-made success is more complicated. She struggles with the loneliness that has accompanied meeting her lofty goals, and she's haunted by the absence of the mother who abandoned her family when Olga was just 12 years old. As hurricane season in Puerto Rico amps up, Olga begins to grapple with family secrets just as she falls in love for the first time. What ensues is thoughtfully depicted romantic comedy full of domestic strife executed in Gonzalez's vibrant prose. So... I have heard some good things about this book so far, and the premise of it does sound really interesting. So it's already on my radar, but again, not in a way that I would have prioritized it. So now that it's been on a bit of a best of list, maybe I should rethink that and try to get to it this summer once I'm through Pride Month. But let me know what you think, because I am definitely open to reading this book. I just... 
don't know that I would try to rush to it. It seems to be a common theme <laughs> with the books that are on this list so far. Let's see what the next one is. Fiona and Jane by Jean Chen Ho. I actually have a copy of that book. Um, I don't have it with me because I didn't prepare to run through this list with you. But yes, this so far, this is the only one I have a physical copy of. It's just in the other room. Actually, let me go get it for you. Okay, got my copy. Fiona and Jane by Jean Chen Ho. Let's do the blurb that they have. In her debut short story collection, Jean Chen Ho traces the evolution of a friendship between two Taiwanese-American women for two decades. In interlinked narratives told in alternating voices, Ho captures what makes female friendships so special by following these characters from their adolescence and beyond. Fiona and Jane's bond is constantly tested, particularly as they navigate loss, breakups, and betrayal, but they always find their way back to each other. In intimate and layered terms, Ho describes the love that keeps their friendship together even when their life tries to pull them apart. That is a concept that obviously immediately grabbed me in because I have a copy of the book here. So what happened after I got a copy of the book is that I heard a little bit of mixed feedback. And one of the people who didn't particularly love this book is someone whose opinion on books really seems to line up with mine a fair amount. So I sort of deprioritized this and to the point where it didn't even get placed on my Pride Month pile of possibilities, for better or for worse. But every time I hear the description of the book, it does sound like something that intrigues me. That idea of growing apart but staying together and maintaining ties with each other over time, even when you have sort of drifted apart. Those are things that I am very interested in. And the fact that there is, I think one of them, one of the um, Fiona or Jane is a lesbian. Don't remember which. But it is something that interests me. And obviously I have a copy, so I will be getting to it at some point. We'll just have to see when. And if you think it's something I should prioritize, let me know in the comment section down below as well. And let's get to the next one. Constructing a Nervous System by Margot Jefferson. Have not heard of this book. Let's see what it's about. In 2015, the Pulitzer Prize winning cultural critic Margot Jefferson released her debut memoir, Negroland. In the award-winning book, Jefferson reflected on her life as she reckoned with what it meant to grow up as a privileged black person in a wealthy area of Chicago crafting a searing examination of race and class in America. The author now returns with a bruising second memoir that goes beyond her personal story, beyond blending criticism and autobiography. Constructing a Nervous System is an exciting collection of Jefferson's thoughts and musings on the world, from her love of Ella Fitzgerald and Bud Powell to her own writing process. That does sound really interesting, but perhaps tellingly, the even the description of the book has a lot it's like half about her previous book and half about the new one. And I feel like I'm more interested in her last book, the one that's more of a strict memoir. So I might be seeking that one out on audio and then maybe I'd follow up with this one. But I mean, it sounds really good, but I think the memoir is probably where I would go first. But if you've read this, let me know what you thought. The next one is Vladimir by Julia May Jonas. I do have access to audio, an audio copy of this. I have not gotten around to reading it yet, but I am very intrigued. And I admit, I had been a little put off by the cover because I felt like, oh, I can't be seen with that book. But I should probably get over myself. But I do have an audio copy, so it's a moot point anyway. Anyway, here is their description of it. Julia May Jonas's outrageously fun and discomforting debut, Vladimir, puts an unexpected twist on the traditional campus novel. Her narrator is a prickly English professor at a small liberal arts college who has developed a crush on her department's latest recruit. Meanwhile, in an investigation into her husband, the chair of the same department, looms large. He's been accused of having inappropriate relationships with former students, but our protagonist could care less. As her feelings for her, the new hire enter increasingly dark territory, Jonas unravels a taut and bold narrative about power, ambition, and female desire. Now, I have seen some feedback on this book that it is a little bit muddied in parts, but it has really good ideas. So that is part of why, again, in keeping with the theme of this list, they've managed to choose a fair amount of books that I'm interested in, but have not prioritized on my pile of possibilities for the year for various reasons. And that's why I have not prioritized this one. But if you've read it, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. 
And let's go to the next one, which is Life Between the Tides by Adam Nicholson. Another one I haven't heard of, and it's got a very interesting cover. Historian Adam Nicholson di dissects all aspects of marine life to make stirring observations about crustaceans, humans, and the world in which we all live in this deftly reported book. In Life Between the Tides, Nicholson zeroes in on the tide pools he creates in a Scottish bay where he describes in lyrical and engaging prose, which he describes in lyrical and engaging prose, blending scientific research, philosophy, and moving commentary on what it means to live. Nicholson's book defies genre categorization as the author, with the help of stunning illustrations, strives to tackle the biggest questions about humanity through investigating a sliver of the sea's inhabitants. That is not the type of book I would usually gravitate toward, but last year for the uh, Montana Book Committee's reading challenge, I got some recommendations for their science and nature prompt from Doris from Aldi Books, and she recommended The Life of an Octopus, and that is what I read, and it was fantastic. I really loved that book, and it does some of what this book is kind of saying that it would do. So I'm actually very intrigued, and I'm going to leave this tab open and see if that is available on any of my subscription apps, because this audio seems like it would be the way to go for me. I do a lot of nonfiction on audio, so... Why would this one be any different? But yeah, that sounds very interesting to me. So far, that is probably the one that I would prioritize the most. And we'll see how that goes. Let's keep going. Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart. So I don't own a copy of this book, but I did read it. And I have a full review of it, which I'll put in the description box down below. I have a complicated relationship with it. Let's do their description of the book first. The latest novel from Douglas Stewart shares a lot in common with his first, the Booker Prize winning Shuggy Bain. In both, young men live in working class Glasgow in late 20th century with their alcoholic mothers. This time, the narrative focuses on the love story between two boys, Mungo and James, and the dangers that surround their romance. It's a piercing examination of the violence inflicted upon queer people and a gripping portrayal of the lengths to which one will go to fight for love. Again, I had very complicated feelings about this book. I think there is a storyline in it that goes too far. And I won't say anything more about that. My review's down below if you'd like. I don't do spoilers in the review, but I do talk a little bit more about my problem with it. I don't think it's a bad book. I don't think it's a bad follow-up to Shuggy Bane. I do kind of hope that Douglas Stewart's next book doesn't have the same sort of character profile. But I think this one is different enough from Shuggy Bane that it doesn't feel like reading the same thing again. I just think it goes too far. And I think it could have gotten a lot of the same points across without being so in your face about some of the violence. But again, my full review will be down below if you would like to check it out. Let's move on to the next one, which is The Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczyk. I hope it has the translator, Jennifer Croft. This was a finalist for the International Booker Prize. It did not win, but um, I've heard a lot of really good feedback about this book. Let's do the blurb before I talk about whether or not I would read it. It's been such a treat to read through Nobel Prize winner Olga Tokarczyk's catalog as her books are being translated from Polish and released in English. The latest, translated by Jennifer Croft, is perhaps the author's most ambitious. The Books of Jacob is a sprawling narrative set in the mid-18th century about a self-proclaimed messiah who travels the Habsburg and Ottoman empires. At more than 900 pages, the novel is a gigantic undertaking. But Tokarczyk fills the chapters with delectable prose to paint a portrait of this complicated man based on a real-life figure, through the perspectives of the people in his life. In doing so, Tokarczyk creates a compelling psychological profile of a mysterious leader that masterfully oscillates between humor and tragedy. It sounds like a really interesting book. I do think that I would probably pick up a different book of Olga Tokarczyk's first, probably Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. I've also heard good things about flights, but Drive Your Plow is probably the book of hers that I would read first. So I am interested in this someday. I'm not really scared by the length. I know a lot of people have. It is very dense. I am not very familiar with anything that has to do with the Bible. I can get pretty hardcore, like, obvious references to the Bible, but I've never read it. I've never studied it. Barely went to Sunday school as a kid. So 
I do kind of worry that a lot of it would be like right over my head, but maybe not. I haven't really heard too much about that from other people. So if you have thoughts, let me know in the comment section down below. But that I feel like I'm, I am more, much more likely to do a different book by this author uh, before diving into the books of Jacob. Let's keep going. I don't know how many books are on this list, but uh, there is at least one more. Uh, it's Time as a Mother by Ocean Vuong. Another one. I don't have, I have a copy of it. I listened to it on audio and I thought it was fine. Let's do the blurb. Ocean Vuong's second poetry collection finds the acclaimed writer wrestling with grief after he lost his mother to breast cancer in 2019. Like his novel, Unearthed Were Briefly Gorgeous, this collection is a tender exploration of memory, loss, and love. Through 28 poems, Vuong showcases his original voice as he asks pressing questions about the limits of language and the power of poetry in times of crisis. I am also someone who liked Unearthed Were Briefly Gorgeous, but didn't love it. I thought some of the prose went a little bit too far, was maybe a little too obvious, trying a little bit too hard, and I definitely felt the same way about the poetry. And it didn't feel like, if you've already read Unearthed Were Briefly Gorgeous, it did not feel at all like there was anything new or particularly interesting in Time as a Mother. That sounds really harsh, but there it is. Um... I have seen other people read it and like it, but it's just apparently I don't really resonate with the material. Let's see. So that is it. That is the list. So yeah, I think the one that I would most likely get to that I haven't already is Life Between the Tides by Adam Nicholson. But let me know if you've read any of these books, what you think should have been on here. Uh, I'm going to say I personally, I would put Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black on this list that was released back in January, I believe. And I really loved it. I don't think I've read anything else from this year that I would add. Um, Violets by Kyung Suk Shin, translated by Anton Her. I, I enjoyed, I don't know that I would put it on like my top 10, but you'll find out for sure when I get to my best books of the year so far. Um, I think the only one that I would say I would add would be Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black. That's something that I would really love to have seen here. But I'd love to hear what you think should have made it. If you have any quibbles with any of these selections, if there are any of these that you're immediately going to read, let me know all of that stuff in the comment section down below. As always, thank you for your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.